finished. It's a word we've been camping on the last week of our journey as we prepared for this morning. It really comes from something Jesus said. He said seven things on the cross. I've been reminding you of this over the last few days. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, expressing his extreme compassion for a lost and broken world. He told a thief who was repentant, today you will be with me in paradise. Taking care of his mother as the firstborn son, he gave her care to his cousin, John. Woman, behold thy son. A little bit later, he cried out in despair, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was fully human and fully God and obviously suffering from the pain of crucifixion. He said, I thirst. And the last thing he said on the cross was, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Those are six of the seven statements, but no doubt. The most famous statement is the sixth one in order. It is where Jesus cried out, it is finished. And over the last week, we've been camping on what that means. The Apostle Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, said these words. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Last week, we talked about how Jesus finished the law. Remember, God is the great law maker. Jesus is the great law keeper. The Holy Spirit is the law enabler, and well, me, I'm a law breaker. But the law maker loved the law breaker, so he sent a law keeper to die for me. And upon our faith in the law keeper, the law enabler comes to live in us, so that the lawmaker sees us no longer as lawbreakers, but as law keepers. Jesus finished the law. Jesus also finished sin Friday night. Right here in this room, we celebrated that, the cross. Peter says it this way in the book of 1 Peter. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So Jesus finished the law by living a perfect sinless life. Jesus finished sin by dying in our place. And come Sunday, Jesus finished death. The grave could not hold him. If you have your Bible, whether you have a device, a smartphone, or a printed copy as I prefer to bring to church, I want you to find 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm about to bless your heart. I'm going to preach an Easter message from one verse. I know you have a ham in the oven. One verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going to preach from verse 58. Before I dive into that verse, I want to remind you what we've been talking about from 1 Corinthians 15. We've quoted verses 56 and verse 55 several times over the last few weeks. Paul founded the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth was in a city called Corinth, and in that city, everything was available. In fact, one pastor out in California famously tells his church, turn with me to the book of 1 Californians when he asked them to turn to Corinth. Corinth was a center of economic growth. It was extremely religious, and every sin under the sun was available. The law of Corinth was basically figure out what you want to believe and apply that to your life. There were gods to sexual relations. There were gods to mysticisms. There were gods to New Age spiritual thought. There were gods to the earth and gods to the sky. And the moral fabric of Corinth was writhing in the pain of sin. In fact, in the book of Acts, when Paul is ministering in what is today modern-day Turkey, a vision happens to Paul where a man from Macedonia says, come over to southern Europe and help us. And on Paul's third missionary journey, he makes his way across the Aegean Sea into the southern area of what is today Greece and ends up in the ancient city of Corinth. He founded a church there and God did amazing work. Paul left, as he so often did, to go plant other churches. And then he got word, the church, not the lost people, the church, the folk that show up on Easter, the church was struggling. There was backbiting, division, 
sexual sin, moral sin. There were people adding to and taking away from the gospel. They were becoming infatuated with debates that didn't matter. The church was beginning to fall apart from within. Paul wrote a letter that we don't have preserved in Scripture. And then he wrote a second letter that is for us, 1 Corinthians. And in this letter, Paul doesn't deal with nuance. He doesn't hope the problems go away. He squares them up and hits them right between the eyes. He deals with all of the debates and all of the dysfunction and all of the division. But then something fascinating happens. About the time he prepares to close this book, the book of 1 Corinthians, he comes back to the resurrection. You see, there were some that were even questioning whether or not Jesus had literally resurrected. And if he had, does that actually mean what we just sang so passionately? Does it mean that we have a future resurrection? That we too will overcome the grave because our Savior will? I recently read an article that a survey was done in Great Britain. And 25% of professing Christians in our neighboring country across the ocean denied the literal resurrection of Jesus. Paul did not see any separation in the term Christianity and the belief of the resurrection. In fact, this is where he begins to celebrate how unless you're resurrected in Christ, you'll never inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 50, and let's read very quickly. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you, mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. He begins to talk about the resurrection of the dead. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed changed. For the perishable body body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. Verse 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written. And this is where Paul breaks into worship as we have done. He says, death is swallowed up in victory, quoting Isaiah 25. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, Where is your sting? And then he gives us that great theological truth we've read the last few days at Church at the Mill. The sting of death is sin. We die because the world is broken and we are broken. The sting of death is sin. And then he says, the power of sin is the law. It is God's righteous standard in the law that is a holy mirror. And when we stand in front of it, it reveals our imperfection. So notice the the logical transition. He says very sequentially, the sting of death is sin. Death happens because of sin, and sin is made apparent because of the law. If the sentence ends there, there is no hope. But notice what he says. He says, but thanks be to God, verse 57, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus finished the law. Jesus finished sin. Jesus finished death. It's why we came in here this morning to celebrate Easter. It's why we look so good. So many new dresses in the house today. All of you guys look good. Some of you got your Easter haircut. All of you were on Highway 29 yesterday doing something because I was out there with you praising God for the resurrection. It was the only thing that kept me from road rage. I know we're going to celebrate Easter today. I know we're going to gather at Mama's for lunch. I know some of you, like me, put on your Easter egg socks. Can I get an amen? I know that. And I'm all about celebrating Easter. I want us to celebrate Easter. But let me ask you a question. In the celebration of Easter, let's talk about the application of Easter. It's one thing to celebrate a resurrection. It's another thing to apply it. Every preacher is going to ask this question this morning if he's worth his salt. How will your life look different on Monday because the tomb was empty on Sunday? This is the great tension of the Christian faith. The world expects us to be in church today. It means even more today because, like many of you, it's been two years since I've celebrated an Easter in person with people. 
Many of you are back and beginning to worship for the first time because you've reached a place in your personal health choices where you feel safe and you want to come out. Some of you are still navigating that and you're joining us online and soon, we hope, you'll join us here live. We're going to continue every Sunday at Church at the Mill to celebrate the risen Lord. But the celebration must be followed with application. In fact, this is exactly what Pastor Paul does in verse 58. It is my text this morning. Paul says these words, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved. Now, you know when you study your Bible, you have to know what is the therefore, therefore. Why is it there? Therefore, because of the resurrection, my beloved. He loved them. No matter how rebellious they'd been, he loved them. My beloved brothers, and here it comes, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Be steadfast, immovable. If death is finished, I want to give you three truths from this verse. Here they are. If death is finished, never waver off of him. Never let the world redefine to you what truth is. Never waver. We live in the most moral, relativistic culture we have ever seen. We are now told, go find your truth. Friend, I found my truth. It's God's truth. He is the creator. You and I are the creation. Don't waver. Some people would say, no, 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 no. Embrace Christianity if that system of beliefs works well for you. But more than anything, just love beyond belief. I actually saw that in a bumper sticker just a few days ago. Our neighbors at the Unitarian Universalist Church, a church that is not founded on biblical Christianity, a church that basically says all truths are equally true, our neighbors there put this bumper sticker out, love beyond belief. Now, there's several ways you can take that sentence. You could say, I love my wife beyond belief. She loves me beyond belief, and there's truth to that. I understand that. But that's not what they mean. What they mean is, your beliefs should come second to the love with which you embrace your neighbor. Friend, listen to me. That's not true. It is my belief in a risen Lord that gives me the love of God. You cannot reverse the two. Of course we should demand that every person in our society be kind and loving and compassionate. And of course God honors any person, whether or not they call upon him. If they honor their neighbor, God will bring certain blessings in their life. But everything in me that has the ability to love comes from a Savior who loved me when I was unlovable. And his greatest display of loving me when I was unlovable is in him coming, living, dying, and rising again. This is why earlier in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, for I delivered to you as of first importance. So Paul says above your praying, above your singing, above your Bible reading, above your church attendance, above anything you do to practice your faith. This is first. This is most important. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins. No other faith offers a solution like this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. But he didn't stay dead. Paul goes on to say that he was buried. The literal, dead, lifeless body of Jesus was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve. That's another name for Peter, that he appeared alive. This is the basis of our Christian faith. You cannot apply the teachings of Christianity fully until you recognize that we believe in a risen Lord. Now, Paul says, don't move off this faith. When you coach kids, you coach every kid in every sport the same way initially. It doesn't matter your sport. You coach the athletic position. What's the athletic position of every sport? You could be a phenomenal volleyball player. You can be a great fast pitch softball player. You can be a great linebacker. You can be a great base runner. You can be a phenomenal point guard. 
Every athletic position begins with your feet shoulder width apart, perhaps a little bit wider, your weight forward on the balls of your feet, your knees bent, your hips flexed, and you engage the largest part of you the Lord gave you. You're sitting on it right now. You engage the largest part of you because that is the biggest muscle system in your body is your backside and your legs, and you are in a ready position. And you're in this ready position, whether you're holding a tennis racket a golf club, a baseball bat, or you're preparing to play the game of football, the sport of basketball. You're in this position, and you're in this position for two reasons. It is from this position that you can move the fastest. If you're standing like this, you'll not be very fast. Ask any coach, and he tells you, or she tells you, if you're standing relaxed with your knees locked, you're not ready to play. But you're also in this position because some sports require that instead of you moving, you're not going to be moved. Namely, the sport of choice for me when I was young was football, and sometimes in football, you don't want to be blocked. You don't want to give ground. The only way to be immovable is to brace yourself for the impact of the opponent and to not move by engaging all of your core and all of the large muscles in your body. This is the word Paul used. Paul says when it comes to the resurrection, don't move. No matter what the world may tell you in its modern thirst for enlightenment, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose again. Tim Keller says this about that. He says, if Jesus rose from the dead, and I believe most of you would affirm that, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? He's in fact a liar if he didn't rise from the dead. The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. So pastorally, let me ask you a question. Is the way you're currently living your life? Your dating relationships, the way in which you're honoring your marriage, your language at work, the way you're managing your finances, the way you're parenting your children. We're not looking for perfection. If you're a guest of ours, you didn't come into a dead legalistic church that measures you by your ability to comply with our list of do's and don'ts. No, 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 no. We're not talking about perfection, but we're talking about people whose life smells like the fragrance of an empty grave. There's a newness about their life. And is that a reflection of the resurrection? Don't waver off of it. Secondly, always work for him. Look at the next phrase. The Bible says in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. In the original language, the word always comes at the end. So it really reads, abounding in the work of the Lord Always. Abounding in the work of the Lord, always. Now, often when we think about the work of the Lord, we immediately think about our ministers, our pastors, missionaries, those gifted folks on stage that lead us musically, the folks in the back on our tech team that are executing this service digitally so that those of you who are watching online can be ministered to. Of course, there is work for the Lord that happens in the church, but this term means far more than that. This is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying... That if he walked out of that grave and if he promises you the same experience, a resurrection, then you already know the purpose of your life. The purpose of your life is to bring yourself, your gifts, your abilities, your strengths, your weaknesses to him and say, I'm not my own. You own me. You were my ticket out from the condemnation of sin And one day you'll be my ticket out of the grave. And therefore, I'm going to bring my life in submission to your will. And I'm going to serve you. Paul talked about this in the book of Romans. He says in Romans 6, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, he's not talking about water baptism there, he's talking about being saved, were baptized into his death. So, 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 So my sin was on that cross. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Now, notice this. You would expect him to say, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too will be raised from the dead. Of course, that's true, but that's not where he goes. Notice what he says. Was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk, not look forward to, 
Not hope for. Yeah, there's a new life. There's a heaven. But now, due to the empty grave, we walk in the newness of life. Newness of life is not perfection. It's just a woman who's filled with the Spirit of God and wants to honor the Son of God under the will of Father God. It's just a man that says, if my Savior truly vacated the grave, my life should look different. One chapter over in Romans 7, he comes back to this again. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Did you see that? Jesus came out of the tomb so that my life can bear spiritual fruit. He goes on to say, for while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions arise by the law. Isn't that not how it works? When God says, I can't do something, if I listen to myself, I want to do it. He says, arise by the law, we're at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But then watch how it ends. But now, we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captives, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. See, so many people who attend church on Easter think this is the code. This is what you do. You, you come to church on Easter. I, I, I just can't imagine. There's tremendous pity in my heart for people whose faith in Christ is nothing more than a mental acknowledgement of the teachings of Christianity and an occasional attendance to a worship service. Anybody here who hasn't been here in a while I want you to know guilt, guilt's not very effective. In fact, I, I, I'm glad you're here. I just want you to celebrate the resurrection with Monday the way you did on Sunday. The newness of life comes through the indwelling power of a Savior who lives in Christians because he's not in a tomb. This is why our vision at Church of the Meals is pretty practical. We believe that God has called every believer in this room to gather, grow, give, and go. And those words are taken right out of the New Testament. To gather consistently for worship and small group. To grow through your time with Jesus and to be willing to grow others. To give of your tithe and your time, your stewardship, your service. And then to go to the nations with the gospel. So many people don't have a healthy church in their community. So many people live in places where there is no gospel witness. If we're really here today because we really believe a Savior really vacated a tomb, then we really have to write a blank check with our lives and ask, Lord, what would you have me do? Often you'll hear people say, well, Pastor, I, I know the Lord. I, I believe. I, I, I'm just not where I should be. Listen to me. Absolutely Christians can struggle. If you want to see a Christian struggle sometimes, come follow me around. Not a perfect person in this room, and there's not a perfect pastor on this stage. But there's a difference between stumbling and struggling from time to time, growing discouraged during difficult seasons, and a wholesale abandonment of the mission of God. Listen to this very carefully. It is not immoral for a person who truly knows the risen Christ to live a life of consistent disobedience and disinterest in the mission of God. That's not immoral. It's impossible. It's impossible. We just don't get to say that Christ has been raised from the dead, covered our sins, filled us with his spirit, and sealed our eternity, and yet muddled through our lives with no passion to serve him and a desire to honor him. So I ask the question again. Is the life you live before today, is the life you plan to live tomorrow, is it a reflection of not just a celebration of the resurrection, but an application of the resurrection? Let me give you one more. If death is finished, then make sure to remember that that is your why. Remember your why is in him. You ever ask somebody their why? You ever been on a team building exercise? Hey, tell me your why. What are you asking for? You're asking, what motivates you? Why do you get up, come to work every day? Why are you here? What's your why? Some of you may say, oh, my children are my why. They're the reason I live and the reason I'm exhausted at the same time. We're broke and tired, couldn't be happier. 
Others of you may say, well, I'm in love, Pastor. We're talking about getting married, and he's my wife. Well, that'll wear off. <laughs> Others of you may say, I'm, I'm in school right now, and I've got this graduate degree in my crosshairs, and that's my wife. I'm going to get that degree. And good for you. You should. Some may say, my wife, I'm pushing hard. I, I, want, I want to build a new home. I want to go on this place. I, I, want, I want to experience this. All of us have our wives, and within reason, and as long as they are stayed in check, there's nothing wrong with having things that are your passion that drive you. But the undergirding and overarching why of a believer's life is this. Whatever I do for the Lord is never wasted because he's alive. Whatever I do for the Lord is never race, wasted because he's alive. That's not a direct quotation but that's exactly how verse 58 finishes. Let me show you what I mean. He says these words. He says, knowing, last phrase, verse 58, 1 Corinthians 15, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. It's not in vain. God sees every act of faithfulness. If you're a young woman here and you're dating a young man that is no good for you and you end that relationship because you believe it's God's will and it breaks your heart, God cries with you. If you are a man or a woman in a marriage where right now it's a one-way street and you're doing everything you can but you're not getting a lot in return, but you're choosing not to obey your feelings and rather to obey the vow and stay committed and seek God's help, God will not waste that pain. If you go to work tomorrow and you say, boys, all of us struggle with our language, but I'm cleaning mine up. Pastor reminded me I don't get to sing about Jesus on Sunday and curse the world on Monday. And they laugh and giggle at you. They ostracize and alienate you. God will smile from heaven and honor your desire to live for him. If you are secretly eat up, with an addiction to pornography that you cannot beat even though you have tried and you finally swallow that lump in your throat and you go to your wife, you go to a Christian counselor, you go to your pastor and you say, I need some help. I want you to know the angels in heaven rejoice every time a sinner turns from sin. God will not waste that. The writer of Hebrews says it this way. He says, for God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. Today is a joyous day, but following Jesus will cost you something. And when it costs you something, remember what Jesus said in the book of Matthew. He said, and everyone who left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Serving the Lord as a regular person who loves Christ and honors him will never, ever be unnoticed by God. Just think about what we've experienced as a people since last Easter. I just brainstorm headlines I've read in the last year. COVID-19, political political unrest, racial tensions, social injustice, broken immigration system, assault on the unborn, moral relativism, social distancing, vaccine distribution, rising fuel costs, challenged education system, mass shootings, the list goes on, cancel culture, socialist agenda, voting policies, the LBGTQ plus agenda, rising health care costs, global persecution of Christians, and a deeply divided country. How do you read all that and not get heavy hearted? not get discouraged. I'll tell you why. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. In fact, Jesus said these words to his disciples just before he left them to go die for them. He said, yet in a little while, the world will see me no more, but you'll see me. <laughs> and, and because I live, you also will live. See, we can keep fighting for our marriage because he lives. We can keep waving the flag for purity because he lives. We, we, we can keep dealing with our sin because he lives. We can keep praying, keep giving, keep witnessing, keep honoring, keep loving. And as the world becomes more and more hateful toward people who will not move, I'm not moving. I will not move off the truth of God's word. We just keep smiling. 
Keep being kind. Keep being gracious. Why? Because he lives. Would you pray with me? I'm thankful for Sunday, Lord. It means so much to me. But I'm thankful for Monday, too. See, because you live, I can face tomorrow. Because you live, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. And life is worth the living because you live. And when I don't think I can go any further, I remember one day I'll cross that river. I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the light of glory and I'll proclaim cause you live. Church family, go live differently because he lives. I'm going to say amen and when I do, we're going to stand. Our counselors are at the altar and they're in the prayer room. You may say, oh, Pastor, I came with my buddies. I'm here as a guest. I'm a longtime member. Today's not the day. We've got somewhere to be. Friend, you've got nowhere to be if God is dealing with you. I pray you would come to this altar, go to our prayer room, talk with someone about something in your life that you want to look different because Jesus lives. When I say amen, we're going to stand. We're going to sing that precious old hymn. You come as God leads. Father, you move now as only you can through the power of your spirit for the glory of the risen Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. Would you sing with me? Because he lives. Sing it out, church. I can face to here. Go live this week like a grave is empty and your heart is full. God bless you. You are dismissed.